Welcome to another episode of the Carmudgeon Show. My name is Jason Discount Adam Sandler Camisa, and that is Derek Tam Hyphen Scott, and we are here to. Aren't you supposed hard. to be singing? Usually you start with a singing. I mean, isn't that getting a little old? Also, the song that I'm thinking about is a little bit out of my vocal range. I mm. mean, I can't exactly expect anyone who's listening to this, like on a podcast app in their car, um, to not sue us when the windshield shatters and then they hit a tree um, because I hit some like amazing Jennifer Hudson high note, which is, you know, what I'm thinking. I'm thinking Dream Girl. The song was Dream Girls, I Am Changing. Um, and that's a. What are you changing? You're changing uh, your uh, exhaust system? I am, I am changing nothing right now, but uh, I think we should do a discussion about when is it okay to modify your car? And, oh, yes. We sort of started down this path last week. I know. We keep, like, you know, we keep identifying this as a potential episode and then not doing it. And it's just, I think we have a lot to say. Well, let's put an end to our not doing it. Okay. And do it. So, Derek Tam, hyphen Scott, when is it okay to modify a car? Uh, I actually think I'm probably a little more lenient about this than you are. <gasps> uh, I was thinking back on some modif car modified cars that I have driven. And what I have concluded is that if the person who modified them spent enough money doing it, then it actually works really nicely. But most of the time, that's not what happens. You are an elitist. So you're uh, saying the quality of the work and the craftsmanship and what they do doesn't matter so long as it was expensive. I call- That's not what I said. Yes, basically you did. I mean- The, the implication is that if they spent enough money doing it, then the craftsmanship quality and like the person who did it will help. What if they spent nothing? Uh, to and do what? Themselves. Maybe they had- Depends on how competent they were. <laughs> I'm trying to back you in a quarter here. Make fun of you. Um, sorry. Uh, do you want me to be I, nice to you today? Is it, is, it a, is it a hard day today? I'm fine. <laughs> I'm durable. <laughs> do whatever you, you, you need to do. You have this look on your face when you're saying it like, I'll be okay. Is, 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 is coronavirus quarantine finally getting to you? Um, I'm doing fine, actually. Is that I drove hard? my car last weekend. Which car? Uh, oh. the, the GT3. Mm, yeah, that would put a smile on anyone's face. Except for there was like a lot more traffic now and everybody's not staying home anymore. Uh, and so the traffic was kind of gnarly and I spent a lot of time like yelling in my car at people parked in the left lane. Yeah. <clears throat> it, was, it, just, it seems like we're back to normal traffic wise here in the Bay Area anyway. I mean, I took the E30 out and did a long drive in it. And my God, if it wasn't like... It was like rush hour traffic all day on Sunday. It was very weird. Oh, on the weekend, yeah. I would say the commuting times are, are better, are still light. Yeah. But yeah, uh, yeah weekend traffic volumes seem high. Uh, okay. So if you had to modify one thing on your GT3 Touring, what would it be? You already know the answer to this question. Because if you say anything else, I'm going to yell at you. I would make it be paint a sample. That wasn't what I was going for, but I can't argue with you there. So the yeah. background story on that was you wanted a paint a sample car. Yeah, you chose couldn't get one. Cool color. They, they didn't have any paint to sample slots available. My car was being made. What would you have gotten? Uh, there's some shades of blue that I really like, uh, blue and green. Uh, it would have been one of those. I would have gotten olive green or Irish green. Oh, great. Now I have to find photos of all these colors. Uh, Pantone 296, which is a great blue, uh, or Oslo blue. It's just called Pantone 296? It is, yes. It's very specific, right? There's no ambiguity about what color it is if you use yeah, a Pantone code. Oh my God, uh, how very like German of them. Like, yeah. like we have Norwegian gray and we have, you know, these ridiculous other names and then we have Pantone 296 points. Ooh, <laughs> that's <Yeah>. very... <laughs> that's okay, so, so you would modify, well, that's not a modification, that would be a modification of the vehicle order, right? So you're not gonna ever change the color of your own car, would you? No. Not unless something happens to it that requires a lot of paint work. The, the one I'm getting at is, of course, gearing, because I think the GT3 oh, yeah. Touring is about perfect um, from the factory, except second gear is like 88 miles an hour? Yes. If you would like to visit Redline uh, repeatedly uh, in the same drive, then you're going very fast. Yeah. And it's a shame because it really has a, a really enjoyable 9,000 RPM Redline, mm -hmm. which I get to use once. 
Yeah, because if you hit it the second time, you're over every speed limit in the country. Mm. Yeah, most that, other countries too. Yeah, th- that bothers me. That I mean, I understand why Porsche does that, um, and it's just a simple matter of Andy Preininger, who did that car, doesn't like the seven speed, so he went to a six speed, um, and the car does 190 miles an hour, 90 something miles an hour. Yeah, it's like 195 without the wing and 197 with the wing, or something like that. Yeah, it's a lot of miles an hour to have to slice into oh, six slices. six ratios. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I just, you know, part of me thinks the, the regular 911 sort of has it the right way. Do maximum speed in sixth and then a cruising gear in seventh. Um, and then, you know, from there, what I would say is actually make maximum speed. I don't care what, like, top speed's irrelevant in the United States. Like, give me something that I can just run through the gears and have a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> and then some. And you also start to get traction problems too if the gearing's too short in a car that has 500 horsepower. No, I mean, 911s are. They have so much rear traction that... Uh, yes, that's true. You could probably get away. Here's the thing that bothers me about it the most is that, the, you know, you have the, the Germans... Oh, I wish I had, like, some sort of German set of spectacles. Yeah, this, this Porsche Doppelkupplungsgetriebe automatic transmission is 0.3 seconds quicker for, on, the, on the run from 0 to 100 kilometers an hour. And then you're like, yeah, because, A, there's no shift in there. I mean, there's a shift, but, the uh, you know, there's no... No interruption. Power. Yeah. And number two, you look at the gear ratios and they, you know, the PDK cars do 28 miles an hour in first gear and the manuals do 48. And they do it for fuel economy, you know, so they can get the, the fuel economy ratings that they want. But they're also neutering the cars in the meantime. And then like, look, this is better technology because it's better fuel economy on to more, more, more faster to 100. And that bothers me. So, mm-hmm. um, if I bought a GT3 Touring, I would probably find the way to spend a lot of money to modify the gearing. Hmm. Is that, how's that thing on the highways? Like engine screaming three, four thousand no. on the highway? No, no. I mean, uh, accordingly, because the six gear is good for 195 miles an hour, if you're using six gear, then the thing is cruising along. It's shorter than I expected, actually, mm-hmm. given how f- high the top speed of the car is. Um, but like it's, it's also be- high rev. So you got to think power peak in that car is, I think, 8,200 or 8,400 RPM. I believe you. Um, somewhere in there. So if let's say it's, let's call, let's just call it 8,000, let's call it 9,000, right? I mean, at that point, because red line's at 9,000. If 9,000 occurred at 190, 3,000 is going to be at one third of that, um, which would be 60 something. 60 something. Yeah. yeah. And that's probably where it is, right? It's probably between. Uh, it's a little months. taller than that. I would, I, I have to check, but it's geared a little slightly taller than that. Yeah, because it will be geared that it will be geared. I mean, this is the way the Germans do it. It will be geared so that top speed occurs at the horsepower peak or right right around there. So it's mm-hmm. probably somewhere around, you know, 3,000 is probably 65 miles an hour or 70 miles, uh, 75 miles an hour. Sorry. Um, anyway, okay. So modifying your car. So would that be a bad thing if I modified my 911 to accelerate through the gears? No. Um, but we get into this world of collector cars where on the one hand, you have cars that are 100% ridiculously perfectly original and are worth more money because they haven't been messed with. Um, and then you have the sort of other end of the, of the world where like people are, collectors are continually shocked that for example, BMWs with modified engines tend to be worth even more. Um, Especially if it's well done and it's like a swap of a good motor. Right. So if you can take a, for example, an E30, and you can put uh, a 24 valve twin cam motor from like an M50 engine from like an E36, suddenly your E30 is worth more money. Uh, and that just wouldn't be the case for most collector cars. Like they're looking not only for the original type of engine, but the actual original engine number. Yeah, and that is a sign that the car is not like a collector car like thoroughly yet. You see this happen with E-types. E-types are often modified uh, I would say the most valuable E-types will be like collector grade cars, but there's a ton of them floating around that are modified because there are certain functional limitations that happen, especially in vintage cars. And so people putting like disc brakes on stuff that originally had drum brakes, for example, like Jaguar XT120s or uh, Ford Galaxies, like uh, or anything that gets a disc brake swapped, like that is a functional improvement. And if the car is not really like a truly collector grade car, then it sort of doesn't ma- affect the value that much. Uh, but would it, would it, out, of, out of curiosity, does it on a collector grade car that you, I mean, that is correct. It wouldn't, do, what does a disc brake swap do, for example, to those cars? Like if you had an early goal, goal wing yeah. cars, right? Can you um, swap go, goal wings came with drums earlier on and then later on with discs. All would the goal wings are drums. All okay. so the roadster switched part way. Roadster switched. 
So what happens if you put the like discs on the gull wing? Would that actually hurt its value or raise it? Um, I depends on the rest of the car. Uh, the only gull wing that I've ever encountered that had disc brake conversion, the car was also a color change. And so it was already it had sort of put it in a bucket that wasn't like a maximum collector grade car. It might have also been non-matching. It was a nice car. It sold pretty strongly, but it had really good history and it was in good condition. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the car's value was probably about the same as it would have been. As, but because the car, whatever sort of minuses associated with the color change were made up for by the fact that uh, the work had also been done at the factory. The car was sent back to the factory uh, when it was like eight or 10 years old uh, and they did all that stuff to it. So it, that helps too. I think a lot of people are concerned about modifications like the quality of the work that was done because it could have been done you know, by a guy in a shed. Uh, and the, the experience of a car that has that kind of modification is different from one that was done by a master tech who'd done you know, 30 cars before. And so it was sort of knew the ins and outs and did it properly. And a lot of it has to do with the, the result or the, like the functional result at the end. Oftentimes when you drive a modified car, it just is this sort of incoherent mess of attributes. And you look at the sheet of stuff that's done to it and then you drive it and you're like, none of this works. None of this feels right. It just feels hacked together. Uh, but that's just why I made the connection with money. If you, things that are like really done with cost, no object by professionals using like top drawer OEM parts, uh, then you get really magical experiences. Like I, the, or like by sort of really great hot rod people, like hot rodders are great at doing this. I mean, hot, hot rodders, all you do is you take this sort of massive collection of options and you carefully curate some package uh, and you hope that it's you know going to work well. And if it's done by someone competent and experienced, then oftentimes the result is magic uh, and it's really gratifying. Like uh, a 300 SL I drove that was modified like that. The car actually was sort of widely circulated relatively recently because it got stolen at the Nürburgring. Um, but the car had like a chopped roof. It had an ostrich interior, which I didn't care for. It also had a competition clutch, which I didn't care for. It had an NSL motor, which is like the factory hot rod motor. Uh, it had a lot of really cool stuff on it. And it was very much built in the way that a hot rod is, uh, which is a treatment you never see on goings. And that car was pretty special uh, in reality, but it had been done by someone who, you know, does this, this kind of hot roddy building for uh, a living and it was beautifully turned out in a way that you would expect for a car that's a million and a half dollars. Hmm. Um, that brings to mind, I mean, I spent some time, very, very small amount of time with the R Group, which is oh, yes. a sort of subversive 911 Porsche group. Or actually, not just 911, just, uh, you know, a group of Porsche enthusiasts who uh, do not conform to the rules of what you're supposed to do with your 911. And they sort of got this incorrect image as a bunch of outlaws and they're a really genuinely great bunch of guys um that i had uh, fun on a drive with and their their deal is we're not building cars to go show off at cars and coffee we want to go drive the shit out of our cars and uh, mm -hmm. and so there are guys that you know there's one guy that had a um some like insane three you'll know i, I don't know anything about the, the in the porsche world but it was like a three eight twin plug blah 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 absolutely batshit engine in his 356 um, and I just thought that was the coolest thing. I mean, like, this is a car the size of a shoe with pro that probably has 400 horsepower. It's the angriest noise I've ever heard. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm, I'm not guaranteeing that there actually exists this 356 with this 38, 20 plug, whatever. I don't even know. I know but, that they do that to 911, certainly. Yeah. And then I kind of, like, I thought that was cool. Like, they're taking, you know, mixing and matching factory pieces um, mm -hmm. and making a car that just does, you know, everyone has different plans for their car. Some people show it, some people drive it, some people putter around, they go to dinner and other people beat the shit out of them on back roads and just, you know, have a blast. Um, and they're taking their cars and just moving the compromise O meter over to, you know, to make the car better at their use case. Um, I mean, so that's what you've done with your VWs basically. And that's I, the place where I think modification works nicely is you take the OEM stuff and you say, here's the array of OEM stuff. So you know, that's going to be developed to the same standard, you know, fitment is going to be okay. Mm -hmm. um, well, not always, depends what you're doing. Right. Um, but you get sort of a certain basic level of quality and like functionality and durability and, and feel. Uh, I was having this conversation the other day about Porsche gearboxes because in 911s, they had a, a variety of air cooled 911s, they had a variety of different gearboxes that they put in them. And uh, people sort of fetishize the later cars that have the so called G50 gearbox because it's a much better gearbox and it feels more contemporary and blah, blah, blah. 
Uh, and then the earlier ones, people, the cars are worth less, all things being equal, sort of like an 80s Carrera, uh, if it has the old gearbox, which uh, is much more old fashioned and is the same gearbox that's used in a, in a Carrera RS. And nobody complains about the gearbox in a Carrera RS, but everyone is like, oh, in an SC or a 3.2, like that's not the gearbox you want. Uh, but anyway, there's this company called Wevo, which makes like aftermarket stuff for Porsches that's really high quality. Uh, and among other things, they'll put a five speed conversion in a 356. But what they originally started, I don't know if they originally started doing this, but one of the things that is probably one of their best selling products is to make a shift kit for these gearboxes that people complain about uh, that makes them feel much more modern. And my brother owned a car with one of these shifters in it, and it improved the experience a lot, uh, which would be great for like a race track or back rows. But it, it made it feel really contemporary in a way that wasn't like consistent with the character of the rest of the car, which was very like 70s and carbureted and like, and so I was like, oh, I, I don't know that I would necessarily need that, depending on how, if you're going to be hauling ass in canyons, sure, if you want a sort of snapshot of, of the vintage experience of the car when it was new, then it, it's maybe less necessary because it just felt really contemporary. Yeah, so that we we've discussed this in the past the the, the sameness of controls, or, you know, and yeah, just controls are just harmony of controls, right? Um, and I've definitely fucked that up. I mean, I have a shifter in my E30 that is too heavy and too short of throw for to match the light, you know, the, the factory light clutch and the way the brake feels and whatever. There's that the sort of one thing that I did that yeah, it doesn't really work, and I probably should undo it. But the the fascinating part is is looking at cars for which there is an accepted aftermarket supplier. And it's like, there. this is the one aftermarket mod that fixes everything. Like Ferrari 355, for example, the factory exhaust manifolds light the car on fire and kill, you know, blow the engines up and all these other, they have all these other weird issues. And so, you know, the sort of, cor I hate to use this word, correct thing to do is you take the manifold and headers off and you replace the, and you keep them. So you can say, I still have them with the car, but then you replace it with, a 2B or, you know, insert name of other uh, exhaust system. And it's just an accepted modification. Yeah, that because it addresses a fundamental shortcoming of the original product. Right. So uh, I think we both agree in that sense. Like, you know, anything that addresses a fundamental problem with the car and fixes it is an acceptable modification. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason you think I'm strict about modifying cars is that I have the Mercedes. So my Cosworth 190 216 I went so far as to get a factory Mercedes battery for the car because I want everything to look exactly as this as it did when the car I don't was think delivered. that's that remarkable but I'm also weird You're like weird. that yeah okay. okay but I will not touch I will not modify that car I mean the speakers sound like shit but they're original the you know I have a Becker radio that's original that's not the original to the car I have the original block phones, but I think the Becker is the one that looks the part um, so that's the one I put in um, I won't do anything despite the fact that it would look so amazing on 16s or monoblocks and clear corners and like you can make those cars look so badass. But I feel like anything I do will change the fundamental way that of, of it, it changes the, the way that car drives and that, that appears. And I love the whole story of that car and the whole uh, warts and all, everything about it. I love the whole thing. So I refuse to change it, which is why I get the sort of strict... It depends a lot on the car. Certain cars deserve to be treated like that. Uh, other cars where it's already, something has already been done or something needs to be redone, I think it's more acceptable to do. It, reversibility also matters a lot. Like my 500E has a lot of stuff that's done to it, but it's all sort of pretty subtle, reversible stuff that is almost entirely factory. Like the car is lowered, but it's lowered using the factory springs because you can just put slimmer spring perches on, uh, which is a factory Mercedes part. It's just not what was originally on the car. And it has a bunch of sort of weird European stuff on it. It has European headlights and European turn signal lenses and has like AMG wheels that are from an SL. And it has some European stuff like it has the Glock box, they call it, which is this weird little box that goes in front of the passenger seat. Because uh, it, I don't know, which was not never fitted. In front of or underneath? Like uh, underneath the, the under your kneecaps, if you're yes. or under your knees, if you're sitting in the passenger seat, it has all these little things that are done to it. It has a steering wheel that's not original to the car, but is a factory Mercedes steering wheel. But mm -hmm. and so that sort of OEM plus thing, uh, which is to take like something from the basket of OEM parts, just not original to that car, I think is perfectly acceptable because it doesn't change the ethos of the car. And so what we started talking about last time was that you would like to make, preserve the character of the car, the original character of the car, but just sort of turn it up 
uh, in intensity yeah. to, I think approximately 14 is pretty ideal. <laughs> um, That's my goal too. I mean, I have three, so it's funny that you said that I'm strict and then, you know, I'm strict about modifications, but I have three cars with engine swaps. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> um, and, you know, they're, that's the idea is like, if they, from the outside, like the, the, you know, it's not, I didn't, what I didn't do, for example, is like a popular modification on the early Volkswagens is to throw a late turbocharged engine in or a VR6. So you can throw a VR6 in yeah. or now all the kids are putting an ABA, which is a two point slow with a turbo on it or a 2.0 T or 180 in there. I absolutely refuse. Aside from the fact that I don't want a turbocharged engine to begin with, but that so fundamentally changes the way the, the, the car drives that you're now turning it into something it wasn't. And I mm -hmm. have a problem with that um, yeah. personally. Like if you don't want the car to drive the way it did from the factory, then this isn't the car that you want. Um, or maybe it is. I mean, cause I'm an idiot because I'm, I'm just now going to contradict myself. I want that mallet LS7 engine Saturn Sky. Um, mm -hmm. and, and then somebody, somebody on Instagram is like, oh my God, if you missed that one, there's another one for sale. And I'm like, oh, and click on the link and it's a, it's a four cylinder turbo. Like that is the last thing I want. I, that car was terrible from the fucking factory because of that wretched turbo four. Um, so no, that's not what I want. So even like on the one side, I'm like, hm, can't change anything. And it has to be exactly the way it was. And I don't want to change the fundamentals of it. And the other side is like, well, I'm addressing a fundamental issue that the car sucked from the factory and now it doesn't. Yeah. So what you're actually saying is that you like modifications as long as they bring the car closer to your ideal definition of what a car should do. <laughs> right. Closer to my ideal. Yes. Right. So I just did uh, this week, uh, the, the spotlight on the Lancia Delta Integrale launch. Um, mm -hmm. And that was, it was fun to do because I spent a week with uh, a red Delta Evo one. Um, and then we did the video with uh, another Evo one, but that's a Martini five special edition that we have in the office. Um, and then at the end, there's a driving video and the driving video is in the, uh, in the red car. And the red car is modified. Um, I, I can't quite, I know this is gonna be a surprise because everyone involved is an Italian. Uh, I can't quite get the straight answer on what's modified on the car. And I've Definitely been told- the suspension. I, I, I know the suspension is modified. I have been told five different stories about the engine. Um, last of which was it's completely stock. Um, and <laughs> well, from the American, you heard that from the American, from the, from the American who also has an Italian passport. Uh, so I don't know what the fuck to believe, but the car is definitely modified. It had 17s on it and we put the factory 15s back on it for the back road drive, um, with sticky tires there. The suspension is way lower and way stiffer than the martini car that I also drive the, the white one that is fully stock. Um, but I don't feel like that car has changed in its personality. Like it's definitely stiffer. It definitely steers differently than the other car and it has absurd amounts of grips. I mean, the car is just absolutely unfucking catchable on the back road. Um, and for the suspension, I was told it's like the group B, uh, I guess it was group A, so whatever it is, it, like it's the rally suspension that was put on the street car. I don't have a problem with that. I have a problem with absolutely none of it because it just feels exactly like the stock car, just more focused. Because it works. Yeah, it, well, the, yeah, the, yeah, the right. reason why, so the answer to the question, the, the core question is when is it okay to modify the car is when, it, when the car still works. If the car doesn't work after being modified or it's, it's significantly functionally compromised, like you were talking about spinning the, 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 your buddy Scirocco, the Canadian one, like in the last episode, that to me is, uh, is an issue. Uh, if the car can't maintain temperature, if the tune that's in it causes it to overheat or mm -hmm. it causes it to, you know, just functionally deficient in a really key, important way that prevents you from enjoying the car, then to me, that's a, that's a fail. That's a failure. Very on logical approach. I'm very surprised at you to be so logical. <laughs> okay. I took an extra sarcasm pill today. Leave me alone. Um, yeah, no, I think that's a really good way of seeing it. And I'm trying to think like, but here's the question. So you've seen my Mercedes perfectly stock down to the mm -hmm. battery. Mm -hmm. If I did, I'm trying to think of like, if I replace this factory self-leveling suspension with a non self-level suspension, would you be okay with that? Even if it worked? On your car? Here's, so the, the perspective for me is that your car is essentially a preservation grade car. It's, a re it's what we would call in the industry a reference grade car. Reference grade, meaning that if all these guys will, and these guys will call up sometimes and they'll be like, I'm restoring an X or Y 
I need a reference grade car to determine like what finishes to put on the hood latch, you know, on the other side of the hood latch, or I need to figure out like how to route these hoses, or I need to sort of really small details like that. Uh, and so reference grade cars, as time goes on, become increasingly rare, especially if it's a car that's been it's modified or restored frequently or whatever. Uh, and so anytime you're sort of getting rid of a, a reference grade car or, or sort of irreversibly changing it, especially irreversibly, that's problematic. Uh, and because I think your car fits into that category, I would be like, mm, I don't know. I don't, if, if you want one that's modified, it's, it is possible to reverse it. So I think at the end of the day, I probably would be okay with it. Um, but I, I do believe in preserving some cars that are really top drawer in terms of like originality uh, because the, those cars are hard to find. And the, the market tends to value those cars accordingly. I mean, you see all these obscene low mileage cars that turn up, especially for cars that are from the 70s because the, they, we talked about last week about how cars become used cars and, and then they get sort of treated in a certain way and, and there's not this sort of preservation mindset. Uh, and that's why it's so special when you find one of those. And so I, I think those types of cars should be should be left alone. Uh, and just statistically, there's such a small percentage of the population that you can easily find one that is a lesser, lesser, a less original car uh, to to fuck around with. Uh, and people, you know, freely do that. And I think I also really admire when, like, you see some car where it's like, oh, that one like got a got stolen and they like lost some of the important stuff. So they're like, when they re reconstituted the car, they you took the opportunity to modify it in a cool way. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, that's fine with me because it's keeping one more of them on the road, which might've otherwise ended up in a scrapyard. Yeah. Um, but to take like a really original car and do that to that is a little bit, I think, short sighted. And I mean, ultimately it's the car belongs to whoever owns it so they can do whatever they want. But I just, in terms of like the holistic population of all these cars, it's nice, I think, to keep some of the really great ones uh, exactly the way that they yeah. were when they were new. Yeah, I have that same dichotomy. I mean, I think you know that's that's why I can I can defend not touching that Mercedes, but at the same time have the cabriolet that is there is literally nothing. I mean, the dashboard and the carpeting is stock. That's it. <laughs> there, like the I'm, windows. The windows are not. I I tinted them. Oh yeah, but I mean. There is, that car, it's a joke. I mean, literally the entire running gear, every single piece of the entire driveline with the exception of the transmission itself um, has been changed. And that mm -hmm. is beam axles, control arms for everything, start to finish. Brakes, um, wheels, tires, shifter, shift assembly, shift knob. I mean, like everything on this poor car. It is not what it was it feels exactly the same it's just you know the beefier version and the faster version of everything um if you were to put that car in front of someone who didn't know anything about vws but like was a car person and you would said like walk me around this car and tell me what you see i don't think they would pick out very much and that is a sign of i think a really well modified car if the person like if, if you take someone who knows stuff about cars but not that specific car and they can walk around the car and not pick out what is modified. Mm -hmm. I think that's really effective. I'm I'm all about subtlety now. Right. And, you know, different. I, when I was younger, I certainly felt differently. I was more inclined towards, you know, more invasive modifications. And I still appreciate those types of cars, like the Gullwing that I was talking about, or like we had a, a V8 Aston V8 Vantage from the 70s, and they did like a six-speed swap, and they made it. I think it was a 6.3 or seven-liter motor for it. That, but the thing was done in such a way that it looked pretty stock and it, it had the right vibe and it looked more or less like it did originally, but it, when you got in it, it worked beautifully and it was an absolute riot and it was a really neat experience. And I like that type of experience best now that I'm like a, a grown up or whatever. That's, it's, I think there is a grown up portion of this. I mean, the Scirocco at one point was way lower than it is now. It had different wheels on it. It had you know, a, a huge, a visibly boom boom stereo. Um, and over the years, I've sort of put it back to stock. And there's, there's a lot modified on that car, obviously. Engine's modified. Um, but the, uh, the overall look of it, European headlights and bumpers. So, you know, it's like back to where I, what, I sort of wanted it to be what the designers wanted. Um, mm -hmm. So European headlights and bumpers. And then I removed the, the there's like a side big rubber uh, bump strip. Rub strip, yeah. Rub strip. Um, and I sort of got that away. And I went back to like, it looks stock. And the only thing that people tend to ask is, that's oh, fuck, is there, I have an eyebrow spoiler on it. 
Yeah. Um, and I did that to address two things. From the factory, the headlights are just so tall that the front end is kind of truckish. And that's just a, a matter of the fact that this car went into production in 1982 and headlights were large and cars were kind of squared off. Um, and the, the way they did the molds, the way they designed the front of the car, there's a bow in the hood and a bow below the grill. And so the headlights don't fit. It's because they're perfectly squared and then everything above it is rounded. And this hide, this hides that. So I always thought it cleaned it up. Uh, it was funny that's the one per thing that people tend to look and be like, that's not stock, is it? Um, meanwhile, there's 15,000 other modifications of the car that they don't see, they don't notice. Um, but I kind of like think there's a time at which a, when a car reaches a certain age, I tend to start putting it back to stock or at least stock looking. Um, hmm. So the factory wheels go back on. I'd love the factory radio back in there. I just went through extraordinary lengths to put the factory mirror on the side of the 308 GT4 this past weekend. Oh, that's fitted? It is. That's fitted. very important. Why are we talking about this like halfway into an episode instead of like at the very beginning? <laughs> Critical news. So th this is funny because you put the mirror that was on the car, right? No. So w the car, when I bought it, had the same kind of mirror, the Vitaloni Turbo, mm -hmm. Vitaloni Turbo, uh, which was kind of floppy. Uh, and so I replaced it because with one that was still floppy, but less floppy. It was very floppy. That, but I bought a new one, hoping it would be less floppy, but it was still pretty floppy. I have the receipt, and I, rem I remember looking through the receipts going, I thought Derek to put a new thing on it. That thing, I under 30 miles an hour, mostly okay. As soon as you're at highway speeds, it just flops down, like the wind blows it down. And I thought, who would design a rear view mirror for the exterior side of a car that can't deal with any wind? Uh, Oh, the Italians. Oh, so you know, exactly. Also, that mirror is factory fitted to Countach's. Not a slow car. mile an hour car, right? <laughs> Not a slow car. So the, the, the actual, the original mirror for this car went, became no longer available about 150 years ago. Um, and I've been looking for a couple of years and they're just, they don't exist. There is, they're, they're gone. And there's one, I found one for sale for like a thousand dollars or some outrageous amount of money. Oh, but by the way, the car has one mirror only. It's left side only. Yeah, left side only. But this was a right side mirror for a right hand drive Australian spec car. And it was like nine ninety five or something. And I'm like, I'm not spending a thousand dollars on a friggin' mirror and then having to modify it to see if I can make it fit not happening. So uh, a friend of mine who is in sort of in the business was at a, a like a tag basically like a, a garage sale and found a new old stock North American spec 308 GT4 mirror and bought it for nothing, zero dollars basically, it effectively rounds to zero at like a flea market. Um, and so I got the mirror and I'm like, this is amazing. It's a, even though it's ugly, I will say it does not look like ugly. And it, it, it looks sixties when the car looks seventies. I agree with that. Yeah. I do agree with that. So it's like the wrong period for the mirror, but then, disaster strikes because I go to put it on and I realize that the factory mirror uses an escutcheon uh, like a, a oh, rubber yes. grommet yes. between the paint and the mirror and this mirror did not come with one so mm -hmm. now what like welcome to like the ultimate in like Jason's hardship life I have been looking for months and I've, we have a, a mutual friend of ours has it also has a 308 GT4 and he's his car is like absolutely perfect show car -y. Uh, and he is missing the rubber grommet too. So he, he and I have been looking around. I found a bunch of dead ends. He found one online. He ordered, he bought two of them because he's a sweetheart of a guy and they show up and they're completely the wrong size and shape. Lo and behold, one day he stumbles across a link for some Fiat part and there it is. It's the right thing. And they're like six bucks. <laughs> <laughs> so he orders two, they come in and he, he's like, oh my God, I think it fits. So like I go and pick it up last week. And I look and it's got like, it's got like, um, like two tits that stick down that would go into the hole in the door, which of course don't fit the Ferrari. So I dremel them off and over the weekend I fitted the mirror and it is absolutely perfect. Um, and so now I can say I have done what was other, like a new old stock mirror that would probably be worth two, $3,000 to some Ferrari guy. I have accomplished a $3,000 modification for my car. I'm upping my insurance. <laughs> I'm mean, gonna have to have the car reappraised. I'm totally kidding. But like, I did go through the links to put an ugly mirror that doesn't fit the design of the car because that's what's supposed to be there. Which one do you think is more handsome? The one that came off or the one that you put on? The, the Vitaloni Turbo, the one that you bought. 
far better looking. It's such a cool looking mirror. It is a cool looking mirror, yeah. but it's kind of 80s and the car it's is from the 70s. Of, right, but what does a 70s mirror look like? I don't know. You'll know better than I were. You were alive and driving at that point. I was just a mere baby. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I genuinely, all I know is the square mirror that's on there now, which is the correct factory mirror, doesn't look like it belongs on the car and the Vitaloni turbo did. Yeah. It looked a little too new, but like, you know, this car looks like a Moon Rover weirdo bizarre car. It's a, just a bizarre looking thing anyway. So bizarre car, bizarre mirror, whatever, you know. Um, so I have, I have like both sides of this like OCD situation where I'm like, some cars have to be perfect. And of course I put a period, the, the radio that was in the car that when, when you bought it was like eight years too new. And I couldn't yeah. know that. It had like an L, a lighted LED display for the, for the, um, F, like the FM frequency. And I was like, uh -uh, you can't do that. So no, I went to have a bar with a little thing that moves across. Yep. Uh, so I, I found a period radio and technically the radio came out the month after the car was produced. So, you know, the same problem with the radio with Mercedes. It was like two months after my car was produced. Well, close. Whatever. I won't tell if you don't. Oh, you just I did. Just did. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So I guess the, the, the functionality of the car, it, like what you're keying into here, I think, is that the car, you have to read the car. Every car sort of has a place where it's supposed to end up. Maybe not every car. Some cars, it's clear when you look at them, you're like, this car is supposed to end up in a certain way. Like if it's close enough to original, it's really undisturbed, you kind of keep pushing it towards that direction and take it back in that direction. Other cars, you're like, oh, this is so far done or so it's so like, it's kind of a blank canvas because everything needs to be done or it, and the car I, th I think to you it's important to read the car because oftentimes we're like oh should I do this or that and and like it's always a little bit disappointing to me like I used to have a 69 911t that we bought um out of Gilroy and it was on jack stands and had black plates and it had been off the road for since the 80s uh and we restored the car we bought it and restored it and it was like very stock looking and it was it was brought back to life in more or less just this fresher version of what it was when we bought it and we sold it to this guy uh and i saw pictures of it on instagram and the guy had done all this stuff to it and i, I think it's reversible but i was kind of like uh that's not the right car to do that to because it was really a pretty nice car that was very much representative of how it should have looked new uh, and if you wanted to do that, then I, I would have said buy one that was kind of all shitted out to begin with and, right. and sort of do that to it. Because if you're going to have to reconstitute it and you're missing like important stuff, like the correct front bumper or something like that, then you may as well use that as an opportunity to build some kind of vision. And I feel this way a little bit about singers also. I'm, I'm no, no f secret that I'm a 964 fan. Uh, and to see those cars get cut up like that is a little bit of like a... Mm, I feel a little apprehensive because those cars were not built for very long and they didn't sell in very large numbers because of the economic recession. And, uh, and so I think at some point as, as more time goes by, people are going to look back on that and be like, Oh, it's kind of a shame that they cut apart some good 964s to do that. And I just hope that they're using Tiptronics. I really hope they're using Tiptronics. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> Cause they deserve to be cut up. Um, yeah. But no, that's interesting. Interesting that you would bring that up because earlier you said, as long as it's done so well, that sort of get, it gets a pass and if there's one thing that singer does is spares no expense um yeah. to make the most beautiful version of that car that it could possibly be but it's fundamentally changed it has fundamentally changed and, and to be honest the experience of driving a singer to me that is so like good and competent and civilized uh that it loses some of the like the rawness and the thrill uh, of the original cars uh and that to me is kind of it's not where I would spend six or hundred or three quarters of a million or however much those cars cost. Um, because I think I would rather have a stock 964 RS, a Euro RS, which is a third the price plus like a new GT3 instead. Uh, those I'd rather have those two cars instead of a singer, but I mean, probably a singer buyer already owns. <laughs> the other the other ones. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to say what you say will be deeply, a deeply unpopular opinion um, about the way the singer drives, but I could not agree more. I drove one of their first four liter cars and. I think it's very, very competent. It's, it's too just, competent. Yes. It's too yeah. good. It was too good. Yeah. It was too buttoned down. It was perfect. 
and there's a like, disconnect between what you're it, this, this is one of those situations where you get a disconnect because the car looks really badass it looks like a competition car from the 60s yeah. and i've driven some of those cars and they are just like you drive around the block and you're like holy crap i need a drink or or something like i need an oxygen mask like it's such <laughs> a stimulating like incredible experience that is unreal uh and so that that is the 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 check that the car writes when you look at it. And then when you go to cash the check, you're like, Oh, this is like, okay, it's like a, a, yeah, it's, I could drive this every day. I could go grocery shopping and it at considerable expense. I you know, it's, and to me, I want something that sets my hair on fire. If it's going to look like that. And yeah. It's, I, very I, subjective. it's very personal. It's very, it's funny, but we came to this conclusion. I expected it to be sort of cantankerous and loud and violent and, um, you know, the way 9 is always moving around at the back. I was like so excited about it. And I got in and I was like, this is more buttoned down than a 997. Which yeah. is so good at being a car. And how do you criticize something for being good as a car? Um, this is, we do it all the time. I was going to say, that's our <laughs> specialty. Uh, that's what we do. Um, yeah, but I, I agree. I think, I think what Singer does is modify those cars in such a way to be the most extreme version of what that car is. And in that way, it's successful, right? It's not changing the formula. It's not putting a turbo motor in it, yeah. with four wheel drive mm -hmm. and whatever. And yet they've, they, they, in the process of making it this like incredible piece of art, they've also taken the flaws out and the flaws are what I like most about 9 um, Yeah. I mean, it's even a bit of a value judgment to call those things flaws. I don't consider them flaws. I love the experience of the way the steering wheel of an early 911 dances in your hand. Mm -hmm. When, when you're driving it uh, fast or even not fast. Even at um, school zone, they're, they're yeah. you know, happy yeah. and alive. Uh, other modified car experiences that were noteworthy for you, maybe like that 240Z, Z. I know that that really- was exactly at the top of my list. I mean, this was a 240Z with a Rebella built three liter and three one, whatever it was, insane. Just absolute beautiful noise, whole the great experience. I, I, Z, a Z is a car that I could really get, get into. It, at the end of the day, most of my cars, most of the ownership of cars is, is wrapped around the engine, right? It's like an engine that I have to have. I don't really care what form the vehicle takes because I want the, what the engine. Uh, and that's one of them. Like, and it just happens to be one of the most beautiful sports cars ever made. Um, what is... Those cars really are well suited to modification, especially because then you can, you can do the exact same thing we were talking about before. You take the OEM set, you put a five speed in from a 280, for example, and... Uh, apparently the hot brake setup is to put four runner brakes on. <laughs> uh, I think that's what this OEM. car had. This car yeah. was like four runner brakes and a five speed from 280 and, mm -hmm. and this monster of an engine. And yeah, those are really great. So, but again, it's the same car. It's just more of it, mm -hmm. uh, more of that experience. Uh, I had an experience kind of like that with a, a Mercedes 220 SE, which is like a, it looks like a 280 SE 3.5 coupe. Mm -hmm. uh, and they had put a 6.3 in it. Yeah, that'd be fun. <laughs> but I think that they left the original differential, which was much shorter because it was meant to be for a 2.2, which means the thing was just absolutely a monster because it had a much shorter rear end ratio than the 6.3, which was meant to go 140 miles an hour had. And so the thing you would just like tip into the throttle, to be fair, the car had very old tires when I drove it also, tip into the throttle coming away from a stop sign and it was just like burnout, effortless burnout at 50% throttle as you sort of gently tip into it. The thing was an absolute riot. Um... But yes, I'm sure that if I had tried to cover a, a thousand miles at high speed, there would have been sort of issues that popped up. But just at initial, like first blush, the experience was really like enjoyable. And I liked that it's a Mercedes motor. I like that you sort of do, and I've seen like 280 SLs get 6.3 swaps, which also sounds kind of fun. That would uh, be fun. So. I mean, most of the time, a big motor swap and a, like an outrageously large motor swap is a, is a fun thing. And to that mallet, or, or, you know, but it's got yeah. As, it as long as the the rest of the car can hang, uh, and I think bonus points for staying within the mark. But yeah. I mean, I'm a bit of a purist about modifications because obviously, like LS swap, everything is very much a thing. And I'm sure if I drove an LS swapped Miata, I would stop talking about how you should stay within the mark because I would be too busy oh. laughing my ass yeah. off to yeah. complain about the fact that it's not a Mazda motor. Yeah, I don't, but I think like the LS is the one get out of jail free card. Like it always surprises me. I don't like when they do it in BMWs because BMW has plenty of perfectly good large V8s. And so like if you take an E39 and do an LS swap, I'm like, nah, I don't know. Yeah, but I like, really like LS to see. Swap into an E30 is great because you can't fit an E39 V8. I mean, you can. It's a nightmare. Yeah. But the LS is so little um, uh, that it fits in these ridiculous places. 
Yeah, that may be. I've seen, I, what, I saw one with a 540 swap. 540. 540 uh, but then you're dealing with a BMW V8, which I'm sorry to say, I would never, ever put up with the shit, that shit. Because, yeah. you know, like an LS you throw in, you never touch. It will last forever. It will make you make a thousand horsepower if you wanted to. The BMW stuff every five minutes. Oh, I need bearings now. Oh, I need a valley pan. Valley oh, pan gasket. Yeah. yeah. Oh, my Vanos thing went. Or, you know, the, 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 my favorite one. Oh, a timing chains. Yeah, the timing chain guide broke. So now it's a 400-hour job to, like, to basically pull the entire engine apart down to individual molecules and build it back up again. No, I would never have a BMW V8. Um, but I could have an LS seven swaps solstice. And there's I entire really, like genres of cars that are built around the swap culture or like the sort of the, the modification culture. I mean, you talked about our group, for example, BMW guys are really great about doing this too with S 52 swaps into like everything. Uh, there is not a single guys? stock Volkswagen in the, in the history of like, yeah. mankind. No one has not mo- motor swapped their Mark one Volkswagen. Yeah. And it's still, the Hondas, same thing. The, the, yeah, Hondas, uh, Beetles too. Beetles are funny because these cars are basically valueless and guys will take like Porsche engines. There's a guy out there. So there was a, the 356 normally has like a push rod motor that's like pretty durable and was used in 912 and is like a, a stout motor. Uh, and then to go racing to get like maximum specific output, they made a version of the motor with four cams, which is possibly one of the most complicated engines of all time. Uh, it's got, well, the early ones have roller bearings. Like it's got, I think it's got gear timing with like a shaft with bevels on the end to drive the timing gear. And like yep. the rebuilds of these things are like a hundred thousand dollars and there's two people left on earth who can do it. Uh, and I saw a beetle with one of those swapped in, which is just comedic because I saw one of those motors sell just the motor on a stand, sell at auction for like two or $300,000. Uh, and the fact oh. that somebody swapped oh a Carrera God. racing motor into a beetle, like I want to meet that respect. person. Yeah, I want to meet that person and shake their hand because the motor is literally worth 10 times as much as the car that it was swapped into. That is so cool. And it was like a beautiful build that was just like gorgeous and had like speedster seats and all this like wonderful stuff. It's just, I, I like stuff like that, which is obviously deeply, deeply modified. But D- deeply like, fucked up. I mean, wow, a four cam and a beetle. I want to see that. I, I want, you're right. I want to meet the person who did that so I can shake his hand and be like, you are a sick, twisted individual. And I highly appreciate it. Flash my hero. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Cool. Well, no more modifications for me. No more engine swaps until at least tomorrow. Until the next one. Is there, so if, is there anything like modification wise on any of your current cars that you would do that you're interested to do in interested in doing? So I'm going to do, I think I want to do slight, I kind of screwed up the E30. So the E30 is 325i engine from the factory is kind of dead. There's no, it makes no power until like 4,000 and then it's 4,000 to 6,400 RPM window of insanity and then rev limiter. So the, the, the sort of M20 driving experience is like incredibly smooth, incredibly sonorous. It's all into, it's all mechanical noise, not really intake or exhaust. And you get this unbelievable sound, but there's nobody home. And then all of a sudden it's like you got rear ended by a freight freight train and you immediately hit the limit. It's every, everyone who gets an E325i does the same thing. And then next year, you're like, and they're always like, what the fuck? Same thing. So I did a 2.7 block under the, the, the 2.5 head. So it's just a long stroke, basically. Um, That's like a 528e bottom end? 520 yeah. So it's one year only. There's 1988, 528e, and 325, which were the super ETA. And those pistons fit directly under a, a 325i head. And you wind up with, a, instead of 167 horsepower, 2.5, you get 180 horsepower, 2.7. Um, but, you know, so you get 12-ish horsepower. Um, and then torque, you get 30, 30 pound-feet of torque. So the 2.7 makes more torque at idle than 2.5 does at peak. Um, the problem is the top, over 5,500, your gains evaporate to almost zero. Um, and by the time you're at 6,200 RPM, there is no gain at all. And so it takes this free revving, constantly accidentally hitting the rev limiter because the car feels like it wants to pull another 3,000 past its rev limiter to a really torquey mid-range engine without a lot of high end, a lot of top end. So it's, it's a relative thing, right? It gains a lot more in the mid-range than it gained up top, so it changes the personality of the motor. And I don't like it. Um, so I don't want to go back to a 2.5 because I don't want to do it in a full swap. Um, but I think I'm going to throw a, a cam in it to sort of cut off. the top end breathing. Yeah. Uh, just 
I don't care if I lose a little bit of the, of the torque gains in the mid range, but I need, I need that urgency up top because it's just now it's the only engine I have. That's a mid rangey happy, you know, like 3000 RPM is the Loafer. happiest day in the world. It likes yeah. loafing. Yep. I, I kind of like engines that, that scream right into their limiter, like I'm making more and more power, like the Lotus, which on the dyno. So it's rated at 220 uh, and it put two or 227, 220. 221, uh, but it put 213 horsepower to the wheels at 8,500 RPM. And it's just a straight line that just, ah, da, da, like right as the limiter is kicking in, it made it its most power. And that's kind of like, that's supercharged cheating. But, um, you know, that's kind of what I like. Mm -hmm. So that's it. That's the only other mod I have in mind before I do something stupid like buy a Honda. Which piece. is unmodifying something that you modified already. It's half, yeah, I want to go halfway back to where it was. <laughs> mm -hmm. And while I'm in there, I'll probably, while I'm doing a bunch of stuff, I'll probably pull the short shift kit out that I have in there. And do the head gasket. Why do you got to be like that? <laughs> How's it, you, is it still leaking? Leak is, a, leak is a word. It's not leaking. Hemorrhaging. <laughs> Pouring oil out, yeah. Uh -huh. And it's stupid, it's just a, it's, there's, you know, there's a, there's a, a non-pressurized oil return galley and the head gaskets just blow right there. And so it just pour, instead of the oil pouring down into the block, it pours down the side of the block and then sprays all over the exhaust and smells lovely. It's great. And it's pissing me off because it's only 13,000 miles on this engine. Um, mm -hmm. It is 10 years and that's the problem, but. Oh well, choice of old car ownership. But, yep, so that's where I'll be for the next couple of months under the hood of that car. Don't blow up your cars, kids. Yeah, do not, and don't ever add a turbo. You're, oh, you can yes. modify, this is, uh, we can just, we could have just said this. When is it okay to modify, modify your car? All the time. So long as you never put a turbo on a car that didn't have a turbo. I agree with that 100%. A notable exception, M30 motor, BMW M30 motors, because there was a factory 745 and those things, they do well with turbos, especially if you take a low compression eight to one motor, then they actually do pretty nicely. Having never experienced one, I'm going to give you that that pass and I'll say, Derek knows better than I do. I accept that. Otherwise, there is no reason to ever add a turbo. But also it was a sort of factory setup, which returns to the, it ties it back. Yeah, it. I will agree, I agree. Okay, we could have ended this whole episode 51 minutes ago or something by just yes, saying, just don't, don't have a turbo turbos on stuff. Perfect. All right, until next week, don't forget to like and subscribe and all that other happy stuff because we will be back next Wednesday because we're here every Wednesday complaining about all of the things that we hate in life. Which is about cars, which is life. Well, we love cars. But I hate that I love cars. That checks out. If you enjoyed The Carmudgeon Show, make sure you subscribe to the ECME YouTube channel and click that notification bell to make sure you're told every time we publish something amazing, which is basically every time we publish anything. Are we done yet? <laughs>